I am Rob Stocklosa. I am a technical solutions consultant with TPM, and I'm out of Raleigh, North Carolina, but pretty much uh, the East Coast, you know, you name it, and, and we can get to you. Um, some of you may know me from the past and, uh, you know, sort of support or whether it was a PDM implementation or maybe some simulation studies. Um, so welcome to all of you. And um, for those of you just meeting me for the first time, I'm Rob and it's great to meet you. We're going to start today and talk about digital transformation, everybody. Um, this is a, a, a different topic and a different presentation than you may be used to uh, if you've attended some of our webinars in the past. Um, usually we're, we're a little bit more poignant and in our solutions are you know, explaining something very direct of what it solves. And today what I want to get everybody thinking about is is a much higher level than the granularity of, you know, Rob, do you have this button? Or Rob, can you do this? Um, I'm finding that getting in the minutia and the weeds of the functionality of these products is kind of overseeing the grand plan that some of my companies and clients are are trying to achieve. So I've been taking a step back and um, I put together this presentation based on that. It, it's really uh, pulled out of the last years of engagements I've had and topics of conversations that I find, you know, small, mid and large companies all asking me the same questions. And it revolves around digital transformation. So let's go ahead and discuss what that entails. So our agenda for today, everybody, is going to be going through the definition, you know, just exactly what is this digital transformation and digital manufacturing that I'm referring to. It's not new, but uh, we could probably all use a refresher on it. Uh, we'll talk about components in digital transformation, uh, you know, tool sets that are out there, whether it's something I offer or not. I'm not interested in only selling, you know, or introducing you to what I offer. Uh, this is a grand plan. It's a it's a project, and there's a lot of components to it. So we'll discuss some of those components, and and you guys can take that back with you. At the same time, I will go into why I think things aren't working. Um, we run into a lot of barriers, and it's almost the same no matter if I'm at a small, mid, or a large company. I find that I have some of the same challenges in the conversation that you know, lends, to, lends itself to this. So I'm going to talk to you about some of those barriers and things that I'm running into. And um, with the intention there of if this is of interest, maybe we can head some of those barriers off, right? If we've learned from the past, then maybe we can apply that to the future. Um, we're also going to talk about tools I have. So how does, you know, TPM engage in this? Where's Where do we fit um, that's what we're going to talk about there. We'll talk about all the things that you probably are familiar with, but I'm going to put a different slant on them because some of the functions I'm going to refer to, you may not be using. And, um, I think it, it, it's, it's those functions that we're not using that are going to give us the, the linchpin, if you will, to this digital manufacturing environment. So I'm going to discuss that with you. We'll discuss why now is a good time to start talking about this and budgeting and asking questions and learning yourself up. Uh, we're, we're not behind the curve, but I would say that the curve has already started and I'm just kind of bringing to light some of the methods that I've seen being used and some of the methods that I see kind of coming in the future. Um, and that's really the content that I'm going to focus on. And the last part of this will be, how do you go about this, right? If this is of interest to you, Rob, that's a lot of information. Where do I start? That's kind of what we'll talk about last, is how do you get engaged in this type of a project? Who are the players, um, you know, departments, roles, all that? Who do we need to be involved? And uh, that will hopefully get you to go back and, and we can have some further conversations with the appropriate people, okay? So digital transformation is, in my opinion, <clears throat> the integration of digital technology into all areas of business, fundamentally changing how we operate. That's a, that's a large statement, right? Um, in the past, I would be typically talking with my engineering folks or someone in design, maybe in manufacturing or somebody in quality. But my statement here for what we're discussing gets a lot outside of that box, right? 
I'm talking about how does your business function? So for many of you on the call, you may be like myself, you're a mechanical engineer or some sort of designer, and you're like, wow, that's, that's way above my pay grade. It probably is everybody. But I think that this level of conversation to solve this type of problem, it's a massive challenge. Make no mistake. We need that buy-in and we need the input from the people above us. And that's very important when we go and approach this type of project. For us in manufacturing, you know, we've been through this, right? We, we've been through digital transformation several times now. Uh, for instance, in my you know, PowerPoint slide, we started with the board, right? And then we went to AutoCAD and then we went to 3D parametric modeling and now we're doing you know, insane things on the cloud. That's our digital transformation, right? Uh, going from an analog type of a, a car, an engine, into the digital environment where we have a computer, right, running our cars, that's a digital transformation. And then on another note with the banking, right, we have going from writing checks to an ATM. All these are examples of digital transformation. So this is not new. We've been doing this. It's just time to kind of relook at where we're at. 2022 is a good year to do that. The technology that we are using has been out for better than 20 years now. And a lot of times I'm finding that that same implementation that took place in 1998 is still what's driving a company today. And I'd venture to say, if I could get you guys out to lunch and ask you if your company has changed in the last 20 something years, the answer would be yes. Yet our technology and our processes have not. And that's, that's ultimately what I want us to understand is we need to look at this. It should be a priority. And I'll talk to you about how to go about that. Main items that I've kind of broken this down to, all right? These are considerations that we almost have to take offline one at a time and build a plan to, to achieve and discuss and, and get that input from all these areas. Typically, in the past, if you were a PDM customer using PDM today, those top three would be what I would talk to you about, right? I really wanted to understand your process. I wanted to understand your technology. Did you have a PLM or an ERP system that we're integrating or a QMS or whatever it may be? And we have a cultural issue, right? A lot, often we were coming from a, maybe a Windows folder structure or you know, Intralink or something. And now we got this new technology with a new process. That's culture, right? In order to get that stuff to work in our company, <clears throat> excuse me, we need the people's buy-in. We need the culture of the company to understand this is the right path. We need to understand, the people need to understand why we're doing it. And then it's all actually achieving the same goal. All right, so cultural is a huge thing before and it's a huge thing moving forward. But that would be the end of my topic, you know, my conversation with you. I wouldn't go into how do you engage your customer? How do you engage your client? I wouldn't ask you about your business model or you know, get into the, the in-depth reasons why you're deciding to do things the way you are from a business standpoint. That wasn't my wheelhouse, but I think now it should be. The client experience, that's important, right? I know for my job dealing with all of you, and I think you'd agree, like your interface with me is extremely important to the success of my company. And, and there's repeat business, right? And, and word of mouth, and that's how, we, that's how we generate new revenue, and that's how we keep things going. So the client experience, we can't overlook. And I think it's time to bring that into the mix. What is that client experience? You know, how are they interacting with you? Are you giving them the experience that they want? The tools I have can help address that. So that's why that's on here. Your business model, we're gonna talk about as well. That's important too. I need to know where you wanna go and, and understand how you're gonna get there. And we're gonna talk about where I fit into that. And that's why things have changed. We need to understand all aspects of your company, not just what's happening in engineering anymore. When you go digital transformation as a company, we have to understand all those cogs in the wheel. Let's talk about each one of those and kind of discretionize what's, what's uh, entailed in each one of those components and some of the questions we should be asking ourselves to understand, you know, is this something I should look at? So with regard to transfer uh, process transformation, um, you know, again, this is, we've transformed, right? We've been doing this probably every 10 years or so at the cycle, right? Just taking a look at if our processes are working. So 
in in our pictures, we can see how far we've come, right? We used to have these aisles. I've seen them. And they would have little bin numbers and we would find things. And now with Amazon on board, right, and, and the shipping and receiving that I see out there, it's a it's an absolutely streamlined process. It's a very clean room. Um, and it looks organized and professional, right? And you can't tell me that that picture in the lower right isn't more efficient than the one in the upper left. And that's kind of what we're after here, right? So things to, to ask ourselves, you know, do are we documenting things correctly? Is there somebody who has to look at this data before it goes out and put their approval on it and they're always making small changes and without that person, this data wouldn't look right and it would be inconsistent? Those are the questions we're looking for. Is your documentation correct? Can you find it? Is your deliverable right, right? All that kind of stuff. The next thing that's come up often, very often, is resource utilization. And I've been doing this for 20 something years with multiple different products. I have seen very smart people do very mundane jobs, often at many companies. And I'm sure some of you on this call know exactly what I'm talking about. But to have a smart person, you know, dedicate their time daily to generating PDFs or to looking and making sure our bill of materials match and understanding, did this revision, did we tell all the components in this revision, you know, what we needed to tell it? That's not good use of smart people's time. So I hear this this often is that people are looking for individuals, but my question is, are you using your individuals correctly that you have? And I usually in a very short time can find out that there are many activities you guys are involved in that that doesn't fit the bill. So resource utilization, instead of looking at hiring people, are we using our people correctly is the question, right? Often this information is siloed between our processes. So what goes on in engineering isn't communicated to manufacturing, isn't communicated to quality, isn't communicated to purchasing, blah, blah, blah. And that's what I'm talking about here. We have very siloed information and that in itself causes our issues, right? We all know that that's not new, but in essence, we do need to look at that because getting communication between these systems and this technology really is gonna help, right? A lot of times those mundane activities are simply because you're siloed. And sometimes this is internal. I've seen it where one group in a company can't communicate with another group. Uh, so, you know, that's something we need to look at. The technology exists. It doesn't need to be that way. Manual operations kind of fall into that PDF and importing data and, you know, looking at capturing bombs and comparing them and all that. Um, that's what I'm referring to, right? Especially on the revision cycle. I watch a lot of people run around with paper trying to figure out if this revision, you know, what it takes to move this revision through the company. It, it's unfortunately very manual. Um, we use some automation, but at the end of the day, I usually find somebody's running around with these papers looking for sign offs and, and then again, comparing things to make sure they're correct before they send them forward. And that's all manual, right? We, I don't necessarily think we need that level of human interaction with the technology we have. The other two here is do you start over in adherence to that process? So often we do start over. I watch it all the time. And the reason is because we just don't have a better method. It's easiest to start over. That's the path of least resistance. We know it will be right at least that way. Yes, it adds three days of time. Yes, I did this last week 17 times, but this is our process. And that's ludicrous. If any of you are starting over, we should be looking at that. There's plenty of tools out there today that give you a jumping off point and, and get you going quicker. And again, we're using our resources, right, to for what they're worth, for their brains, not for capturing this starting point. Uh, let's get them doing the detailed and the customized um, designs that are required to that project, right? So that's the goal there is do we start over? If we do, why are we? And is there something we can look at? Within that is process adherence. Many times our processes are too complicated. They are siloed, they're manual, they're all these things. So the employees start to break down, right? We, we realize that certain things are not in place and it just gets tiring after a while. So I see this as well where, you know, people want to adhere to a process, but over time we start to diverge from that and it, it becomes that wild west mentality. So 
Um, those are things to consider as well. And that's part of the project plan when you're looking at this. Technology transformation, I don't know, I have to say much here, right? It's come a long way. We have graphics cards that perform miraculous activities these days. We have terabyte drives, RAM that we only imagined in you know 2000. So technology is finally caught up to our applications, if you ask me. I've been I've been trying to do FEA and fluid dynamics, you know, for years and years, and it just took a long time, right? And finally, now with some of these high-powered machines with the cloud-based systems, I think that the technology is caught up. The speeds are there. We can calculate what we need, and we can get information to help streamline things before we ruin parts. So we want to take a look at all that. When you're talking about technology, we want to discuss when was it installed. Because like I said, I often find out that people are running technology and processes that were developed in the 90s. And, and yet, when I ask them about your company, you guys will all tell me everything's changed. We've you know acquired several departments. We've changed this. We added new product lines. Yet the technology and the process hasn't changed that much. So it's a little bit lipstick on a pig, right? We're kicking the can, making things work. But I'm telling you, in that mentality, there are people who are doing things that we're not aware of and they're manual processes and they're not exactly happy with those processes. Um, so that's why we look at who is involved in this. Um, has your business changed, as I mentioned, right? That's a big one. And, and if we look at the business as a whole, that might help drive some of these other questions. What's changed? Where are we going? And then we can make some good decisions on some of these other aspects. All right. Number four, does your current technology prevent you from moving forward? Most of the time, that's the case. I have so many companies that can't upgrade because if we do, their interaction to their ERP, their PLM, their MRP, their CRM, whatever, it fails, right? And we're now pigeonholed and we're all stuck on 2011 versions of, of, you know, of our software. So this is a thing we've all got, we've all, almost everyone has a story, you know, where we, we got nailed on that. Um, and it's because we have so many different applications and we're all trying to get these things to communicate today. Um, but that's what it lends itself to, right? Is we end up pigeonholed where one department can't move forward. So that's important to concern, to be concerned with. And again, that siloed process, anytime I, I see that, that is a disjoining technology, right? That means that your ERP, your PDM, your this and that, they're not communicating correctly. Somebody's having to copy and paste from one monitor to the other to get their bombs right. You name it, you know what I'm talking about. That's what I'm indicating here. When things are siloed, it it you know it institutes it's it's an environment for, for manual processes and not utilizing our resources correctly, because we're having someone's someone's taking care of it, right? And we don't always know who. Um, but when we get into the process, I find people all the time, you know, manually take a sticker from a box and move it to a different box, and I'm like, why did you do that? And it's because they have to. So it's things that we want to look at. Um, you know, these siloed processes really disjoin our entire process as an overall scheme, and it creates a lot of redundancies, error prone, and we don't use those uh, resources correctly. So that's important. And I mentioned culture, right? We all know culture. Well, for me, as an implementation consultant, I would say that for me, this is the number one item that I could tell you whether things will fail or we will be successful. It's about the culture of the company and the people that I deal with. So, you know, there's the old saying about hearts and minds, it is true. But I also want everyone to understand whether you're an engineer or you own the company, we're all after the same goal. I talk to everybody in your companies and everyone wants things to work right and work good and be more efficient and make more money. But we go about it the wrong way. And that's really what's kind of funny to me as a human nature. You know, we're all after the same goal, yet there's sometimes some animosity when this new processes and technologies get rolled out. And I think a lot of that is just simply we don't engage the right people. We don't get input from everybody like we should. We don't give them the right documentation and training. Um, you know, that these are things, lessons from the past, right? These are things that we have seen and we've probably all been part of. So 
to be successful, whether it's PDM, digital transformation with, you know, as a, as a, an entire enterprise, I think culture and getting this type of, you know, input and feedback from our people is extremely important to be successful. So I do not want to understate that. Um, that can take some work, but we just need to be all on the same page and understand that these tools are going to help us and we will get you trained. That's important, right? No one wants to feel like their job's being superseded out. So in any anytime we have technology, we need to understand the roles of the people and how we're going to engage them. I mentioned client experience was an item that I really didn't ask you guys about in the past. Um, that is true. <laughs> it was not, not something I really was concerned with. Uh, however, um, with these tools and the way that this process is, is laying itself out, the client experience is part of this. Um, often when we, you know, these models, you're gonna see these 3D models that we are building are not just 3D models in the future. They get more and more important as the years get, go on. Um, ultimately what you see here, you know, McDonald's is going to this like NVIDIA AI based ordering system, right? Um, if you don't have your stuff in a digital format, right? If they don't have some way where someone presses a button and says, I want a large fry, if they don't have a way to capture that, then you don't even have a pipe dream of going to like, you know, some fancy drive through. You're still going to be paying people to take the order because you need a human brain to make all those important decisions. So going digital as a whole is beneficial. All right. And I'll talk some more about that. But we can't improve some of these areas like the client experience unless we go digital. And that can be sometimes tough for us to you know, pill to swallow, right? Um, but that's important because it enables us to utilize some of this new technology that's coming on board. So again, questions to ask yourself. I'm not going to dive into, you know, are your clients happy or mad too much? But you guys know um, and put yourself in their spot, right? Put yourself in their perspective. What is it like to deal with you when they call for a, a replacement part or they want to order that assembly again? What's it like? How is your response time? And then I would say on the other side of that is how are you responding internally, right? I see a lot of running around and this it's smoke flying, right? And then all of a sudden out comes this part and we hand it to the customer and, and they don't even know that it was chaos, right? That's not good either. So we want to look at what's happening internal to achieve that customer experience. And we want to understand what their experience and what their opinion is of dealing with us. Um, all these tools tie into this. That's why this is important. If we answer these questions, then we can structure the project correctly. With regards to our business model, again, you know, I'm not a MBA, I am an engineer, but I understand how businesses work and I certainly understand how manufacturing businesses work at this point. Um, one of the things I often run into is the quoting, that quoting is killing you guys. And it's, it's more often than not, in fact, that you're doing a lot of quoting work, you're getting a 20% of that business, and there's a lot of loss there. So I would like to, I would venture to say, you know, that that's, that's an opportunity. We have tools to help you get that quote together very efficiently and get something to that client without spending much time on it. And that's what you need to be looking at if quoting is something that you're battling with or you have, you know, again, it's a resource thing. Often there's one or two people that do quotes and they're just, they're slammed. So um, just know quoting in itself, we have a lot of tools you should be looking at that will help get you into a more efficient process. And it all does tie into digital transformation. You know, it's again, it's, it's all digital, it's all web-based and we're looking for people to just fill out forms and right, we get some, some items. Um, so we can talk some more about that. I often ask what a company's plan is and they have big plans, <laughs> but when I ask the follow-up, how are you going to do that? 99% of the time, I don't have a great answer or I'm not getting a great answer. And that tells me that there's, again, we need to put some thought into how you're going to get there. I'm not saying I can achieve all of your plans. But I think that digital transformation and getting into a digital manufacturing environment is part of that and should be part of that and is going to help you, you know, with those gains and, and whatever goals you have. 
So that's why this is important is our tools nowadays become part of your business plan because it helps you achieve your goals. And that's what you need to understand there. Sometimes compliance, you know, is important to you and, and you're not able to quote with certain environments because you're not compliant. Again, these tools get you compliant. They get you past ANSI and ISO standards, and, and that becomes an easier day when you get an audit. Um, and it also allows you to get into that field, right? And, and hopefully gain some more uh, business out of it. Um, the time spent on lost opportunities, right? Quotes, I mean, again, if you're, if you're killing, if you knock out 30% of your quoting, that's pretty good. So the rest of that's just the loss. Um, but we need to look at that, right? How do we mitigate that kind of thing? It's, it's there, it's never going to change, but how do we mitigate that loss? And then the next question is, you know, why aren't we, why aren't we closing more of that? Um, maybe there's something we can aid in that as well. Maybe there's some graphical pictures or whatever, right? Um, something that helps close that sale. The impact of departmental decisions company wide. This is a big one. Usually one department makes a call. It, it helps them but the other department's not involved. That gets this disjoint siloed process. This has happened almost everywhere and it always happens when new technology is implemented. We need to start looking at the, the company as an enterprise and not addressing departmental issues on their own. That's big. We now have remote, remote workforce um, requirements that have come on since the virus. You know, this is another big thing. How are you handling that? Is that inhibiting you from getting the engineers and, and the people you need with the talent because they're not local? Um, you know, that's that's something that we run into quite often. And we have some tools to help you mitigate that as well and, and bring that on as part of, of your you know onboarding process. That that's we are a remote workforce. We can have your work remote if we need to. Um, but you got to have the right stuff in place for that to work. And then number seven is one that really hits home when I ask people about this or when I ask companies, you know, if, if, if China or somebody came out with, you know, something that was your intellectual property uh, or a competitor here in the States, you know, how do you respond to that? What does that take within your company to pivot and, and change how you're going about things to stay ahead of that curve and be innovative? Um, that's a big one, right? O often our processes are very specific. So to change, <laughs> that's not happening overnight. That's that's a year plan, right? So everything that I'm going to be talking about, all these tools, they're very flexible. That's the goal. I've kept this in mind. I've seen how businesses change and the flexibility we build into these projects is what's going to enable you to to really, when things happen out there, you're going to be able to make that change internally in your company very quickly and rise to the challenge, if you will. Okay, so again, much different conversation than we've had probably prior to this, right? But it's something to consider. Reasons that we are where we're at. Um, again, I said that I think understanding the past is important. Um, this, is, this is things that I've come across um, personally and, you know, through reading books and whatnot, but um, there's many reasons that this technology and processes fail. I mentioned culture as being one of them. That is huge. But there's also all these other ones, right? I almost could have kept going with this list till I ran out of paper. Um, but this is important to understand because there's no sense in embarking upon this if we still have, right, this kind of attitude, if you will, in the company. We need to get rid of this. We need to see the vision of where we're going. We need buy-in from everybody. We need everyone to understand why it's important. We need to set aside our egos, right? That's a, a big thing I run into, unfortunately, is, is people do a job and then they think that that job's going away. And, and like I said, it can, you know, they, they wanna be important, right? We all wanna be important. You're not less important. You're just doing something different, right? Um, so just take note, reasons that these types of implementations fail, this is some of the heavy hitters I've found. And, and make no mistake, you know, learning from that, I, I, I take that into account with every account moving forward. Anytime I'm dealing with any of my clients, these are kind of in the back of my head, you know, gotchas that I'm trying to avoid. And I, I formulate a plan that avoids these. 
uh, or make sure that I have addressed them, right? So it's important to understand why this stuff fails because I hate to say it, large implementations of data management or ERP systems and things, they do fail probably more often than not. So let's talk about why your company is still where it's at <laughs> and everyone's not using this. If it's so great, right? Well, this is why. Um, you can see on the bottom, I have a, uh, I have some technology that's changed over the years, right? And again, to a, to a person with a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? If it's the tool we have, then that's the tool we're gonna try to figure out how to utilize. And that's that's designers and engineers, you know, that's that's built within us. That's almost who we are when we're born, is that innate need to just keep going and figure out with the tools I have, how do I make this work? And that's great. But unfortunately, I think we do that a little too much and we make, you know, really shoddy tools work, but no one knows that they're shoddy because they're working. So same kind of concept, right? I have a hammer. It's working. What's the problem, Rob? You know, why do you, why you think I need something different? But you maybe you're using a rock, right? Maybe you're using a pet rock to nail that hammer or that nail in. Maybe you've upgraded in you know, 2004, and you got yourself a real hammer. So now you're nailing the nail with a real hammer. And where I'm talking about everybody is a nail gun. You know, that's kind of what I'm discussing here. You do have a tool. I'm not saying you don't, and I'm not saying things don't work. I'm just saying I can nail a lot more nails in more efficiently and better, right, with the right tool. And, and upgrading to the new technology, you know, a nice lithium ion battery pack or something. And that's kind of how I see it out there. I think a lot of us are still using a hammer. We're not necessarily on a pet rock per se, but I think we're using a hammer and we're not seeing that there is a nail gun out there because we already have a tool. And that's one of the barriers is things are working, Rob. I don't need this. And, um, Yet, you know, when I interview and talk with my clientele, I know that that's not the case. So, that being said, the main issue that I run into with I already have a hammer is your bill of material. And for me, this is probably the most important slide or consideration in this type of project. I I've, I am under the belief that we are going about this all wrong. <laughs> in fact, I think that doing our M-bombs in a PLM or an ERP system, I don't know that that's the right way. I think that was the right way when we had the tool sets that were given to us back in the day. But when I take a step back and I see how companies are, are handling things and, and how big they're getting, um, that that there's no flexibility in that. When a company changes or adds or does anything to that process, that ERP or that PLM system drives the enterprise and a change up there really can impact the entire enterprise. So it's not flexible and I see it all the time. And when an in in example of that is just a company that has, you know, a location say in Wichita and a location in Florida. What if those two departments or those two geographic locations have different deliverables, different product lines, different this, different that, yet we're all tied to the same PLM ERP system? There's no flexibility for those different geographic areas to kind of handle what they want. So I'm not saying it's wrong. It does work. But I'm telling you that it, it pigeonholes us into a situation that we cannot make changes and in some cases, you're inhibited from upgrading because of this, right? We've all seen that as well. So my take on this is I want everyone to be aware that your bill of material is probably the first question you should be talking about. How do we generate our engineering bill? And how do we generate our manufacturing bill? And look at that process. I promise you that they're being done most likely in different products. I promise you there could be a copy and paste routine in there. I promise you it's manual. I promise you that your resources are not being used correctly. That's the ultimate to me. This is the this is the core root cause of this problem. And I'll explain a little bit more why I think this is the core. So 
Today we're doing our M bombs in usually a different system than PDM, and we're tying into this enterprise. Yet all of our little departments are tying into that, and they don't have that flexibility to get out of it what they need. I propose moving your M bomb into a PDM system like we have or SolidWorks Manage because we can create custom workflows, we can create custom deliverables, right? All of our documentation can be handled in its own way. Um, it's, it's the M bombs that we generate, which we do at, uh, generate everybody. Um, there is a link to that, but what, if I could generate my M bombs at each group, right? And then push that to my ERP system, my ERP becomes less uh, inhibiting, right? Because it's kind of just maintaining everything for my company. Whereas the PDM system or the PLM at the lower level is giving everybody that individual flexibility. It's a little bit of a radical change, but I, I think that this is something we absolutely should be looking at first is how are you handling your M bombs and your engineering bombs? What programs are they done in? And is that efficient, right? And that's why I have stop right there because I think we need to look at that heavily first, aside from everything else, and understand what that would take in our company to create those two sets of data efficiently and get it to communicate forward and backward, all right? Um, this is important. And I'll talk to you a little bit more, like I said, about how I, I roll this into our solution. So for me, number six, bombs are the key to success. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's our deliverable, right? No one really cares about our pictures. A lot of times we, we want an accurate bill of material. We want an accurate manufacturing bill of material for the floor. And that's what we're after. That's usually what our managers want. Just, you know, if that's good, then we're good. Right. I don't know. I don't care about these pretty pictures. Just make sure that bomb is right. And that goes for electrical folks as well. So that's why I say if there's any, um, anywhere to start, I would probably say look heavily at how you're handling your bombs. And again, you know, reach out to us if you want to talk about this. And that's why I say, so why aren't we using it? It's crazy. PDM has both of these capabilities in it. SolidWorks Manage has these capabilities in it, yet we're bouncing between many platforms. And I'm telling you that flexibility, it's just not there. So this is why, this is why I believe what I'm saying is important. And this is why um, I think things are going to shift back to us. We've, we've seen it, and, you know, I'm not, I'm not calling the future. I'm just saying this is the trend and I don't see it changing. So in the past, we started with 2D drawings, right? That was our master. That didn't give us a lot, but it did the job for manufacturing and building things. Then we went to a 3D model and we start getting these nice 3D models with metadata built into it, right? And, oh man, now I can see the project number and the whatever, you know, the client and all this cool stuff and I can search and query. So that was our next step is a model centric environment where that metadata is now attached to our model. That was not the case when we were doing drawings per se, right? Not that rich data. Then we went in, and if you recall, probably in the last 10 or 15 years, we started talking in the SOLIDWORKS community more about model-based definition and model-based modeling. That's not new, right? That's been out, just so everyone knows, that's been out since the 80s and 70s and 80s. Um, it's just, it's getting to our community. So um, that is not a new technology, but at the same time, I'm not sure that everyone's adopted it in SOLIDWORKS like we have should have. We have many tools, you know, surrounding that with our inspection program, model-based definition, where we add GD and T and, and that information directly to the model. That's what we're discussing, right? And that's kind of old news. I mean, that, that those functions and that type of mentality, that's been out there. Whether using it or not is a different story, but it works. And it, it works because everything we send our stuff to doesn't require paper anymore. Right. I send my I send my parts to a CNC. I send it to a 3D printer. I send it to a CMM machine. Why do I have a piece of paper? And that's the whole goal of model based definition was to get into digital manufacturing. Right. Where where we have these automatic sign offs and everything is a digital format. No more paper. The future is a model based enterprise. And I know it is 
because I can see the tool sets coming out. I can see what you guys are doing to your 3D models. I can see how important they've become. I can see when I do a PDM implementation, the roles of people that we're including. You know, I mean, the roles in your company, everybody, we are including almost everybody. There are plenty of implementations where I have many, many departments who are engaged in the PDM system. That's That makes me smile because I know we're heading the right way. If we are going towards a model-based enterprise, why is everybody connected to the ERP system and not the PDM system? And if we want to move our bombs, you're going to have to be connected to a PDM or right or manage. So a lot has to happen. It is a little radical, but I know that's where we're heading. Nobody can deny that our models are not becoming more important year after year. And it's because we're adding that, you know, just we keep adding information to it. And other departments in the company are finding out the tools we have and they're engaging in that. So that being said, the future is driven from our models. It will be, I don't see any way around it. Whether we stay desktop platform or we go to the cloud, that does not matter. The 3D model is becoming more important every single day. That being said, we need to build up that information. We need to manage these tools from the model. That starts with PDM. I think everyone would agree with that, right? The model is important. The model is housed in a PDM system. It doesn't go directly to ERP. So we need to shift our mindset. You know, when we are doing digital transformation, I believe PDM becomes one of the most important components in that process. I think this is important because I believe that that's how UFOs are created and I'll stick to it. So, <laughs> and once we, once we find those little guys, they're going to tell us they've been doing a model-based enterprise for uh, 300 years, you know? I think it's extremely efficient. Um, and like I said, the technology is here now. It's something I'm willing to discuss because I believe, you know, our graphics cards, our cloud-based systems, everything is in place. It's, it's a matter of us putting uh, two and two together, if you will. So let's talk about these tools that you have available to you. Um, anything in red pertains to me and TPM. So we do PLM when we do PDM. We have design automation in our DriveWorks suite, which is a CPQ program. So again, there's some automation and, and you're asking questions to fill out things and give you a jumping off point. We have this 3D experience coming online, which is a full cloud-based cl uh, platform with many different um, applications that tie into it. If you're not using 3D experience, we have cloud in general, right? We have IBM cloud, Azure, all this stuff is out there. Um, many of you are on that. So that's an option as well, is just simply going to a cloud-based platform and, and looking at utilizing some of these tools and processes I mentioned. Of course, SolidWorks Enterprise with its PDM, uh, PDM professional is what I would refer to here. Um, that's the core application I would use to manage these bombs to get these roles and all these groups and people in and give you that flexibility. It could tie into SOLIDWORKS Manage, which I will talk about in a minute. PDM, it does not stand for the Pakistani Democratic Movement, just so everyone knows. PDM is product data management, and many of you are using it. And unfortunately, we're using it to store our data often and bumper revision but there's much more going on in there. Some of you have you know, initiated uh, sign-off procedures that are electronic um, and taken that next step. Some of you have integrated to your ERP system and taken that step. Um, if you haven't, those are things that we should be looking at is, you know, are you utilizing PDM to its fullest functionality? Because it does have a lot of tools in it that might play nicer with your ERP or PLM systems, and it's worth a look. It's worth a look at moving where this, you know, what tool does the job of certain um, requirements. So PDM, again, very important. SOLIDWORKS Manage was a newer product several years ago. It kind of takes PDM to the next level into that lifecycle management where we have project management, much richer tools for handling, you know, tracking and status of things. Um, I love SOLIDWORKS Manage for, for what I'm discussing. 
if that's, you know, something that you want to discuss, because many people are not going into that, I would think that if digital transformation is something you're looking at, you should be looking at Manage. It's a SolidWorks native product. It handles our data great. It handles other people's data great. And it does everything I'm talking about here. And it's all built into it. So PDM is a component in that. With Manage tied to it, it's a full solution for sure. 3D experience is a little bit future, right? We've all started to hear about it now, and it's our cloud-based based platform, and that's important to understand as well. I don't know that we're all there yet. I don't know that we're all comfortable with it yet, but I would probably put that on my you know, list of things to discuss if digital transformation is a goal and an initiative in your company. You should be learning about that and reaching out to us to understand what that tool does. AI and ML, machine learning, we don't really do this per se, but I have customers that are interacting with it. You could potentially have feedback loops from the cloud into programs like drive work and manage and things like that. You know, it's all, it's all capable, but I do see where we're getting to this point where you're going to drive up to your company and it's going to say, Hey, Rob, you're back. Thanks for purchasing that last, you know, system from us. Would you like this new one galvanized? And that's kind of where we're heading because we have this technology, everybody. We have it. We can start getting information from our clients and apply that, right, without wasting time because now there's no person there and that client interface is changing. Not only that, we're getting feedback loops. So I send my product out uh, into market or wherever and the thing connects to Bluetooth, which connects to wireless and sends me back data, real time data of how my system's performing. That can be replugged in to all my calculations and help optimize my design. I see this happening in aerospace. I know it's going to trickle down. That's how we understand, you know, the performance of a jet engine real time. And those engineers get that, take that data and make a better jet engine tomorrow. And that's kind of where we're heading. But again, this is all digital. And, and if we're not digital, this is a pipe dream, right? We got to get this stuff into that kind of format. I mentioned quickly, Sol um, uh, I'm sorry, DriveWorks. Um, this is our design automation. This has been a big heavy hitter for a lot of companies. It is streamlining things. It is taking better advantage of your resources. DriveWorks basically takes your models and puts it into a logical format where you can answer some questions, fill out some variables and get a jumping off point. DriveWorks communicates to all departments in the company. So uh, I like to refer to it as the water, you know, it just finds its way in all the nooks and crannies and communicates. This is another tool. I would definitely, you know, if this is an initiative, I would say, let's talk about DriveWorks. Let's see if DriveWorks might be a good solution to get you the into that digital transformation age we're talking about. So keep that in mind. I, this has been around a while, but again, the technology is caught up. We have some great experts on staff that do this for a living and they know this program inside and out and how it interacts with an enterprise. So this is a tool I would use um, based on you know, your requirement. And then number four, our cloud-based systems. So as I said, many of you have cloud um, or are going to cloud and that's your own initiative, right? You're, you're putting in a cloud-based server somewhere and, and we're putting lots of software up there, including PDM and manage and everything. Great, I don't wanna argue that. Um, the other option you have moving forward is gonna be the 3DX platform, right? Understand what 3DX is, everybody. It addresses everything I'm talking about, all right? Again, is it the time for that? I don't know. It's probably something to look at. But this is the future, right, if you will, of how all this stuff gets wrapped together. We need a single source of truth. We still don't have one. I, I call PDM the single source of truth, and it is for engineering, but it ain't for anyone else. We need one single source of truth. Where's that bomb? Where's my M bomb? Where's my E bomb? Where's my drawing? Where's the revision? Right now, that's all over the map. That's why I like 3DX. It gives me one single source of truth at the center and allows all those roles and departments to interact. 
for me, I think that's a linchpin in achieving what I'm after here, for sure. And I will keep up with 3DX like no one's business because I think that it is absolutely going to be the future um, for all of us. So that being said, we've talked about a lot. There's some tools and considerations and right, where do I go now, Rob? Um, that, that's, that's the question of the day. I would approach this like any project, you know? First of all, understand your current condition. A lot of times we don't. And a lot of times we think that that process we have written down in Visio is our process. But I challenge you, is it really? So, you know, be real. Make sure that you don't have people taking that sticker from a box and moving it from one box to the other. Because often that, that does exist and we're just not aware of it. So we need to be aware of the current conditions because if we're not, we don't accommodate for that, right? If we don't know that problem exists, then we overlook it. And, and the new solution doesn't even take their problem into account. So it's important to be real and, and write that down. And however you get that information, you know, it's up to you guys. It, it can be tricky sometimes to get people to talk their minds, but we need to understand the current condition so that we can really account for all of that. Um, understand those resources as well, right? And, and be clear on that. That person who takes the sticker from one box to the other, we want to know that that's taking place. And if they didn't do that, the box would have went to the wrong client, by the way, right? So that's important to understand why the sticker was moved and what, what that achieved and how do, we, how do we fix that. Wait everything out. These are huge projects. We can't address everything at the same time but we can address the heavy hitters, right? What's the, what's the impact to putting in a PLM system with manage? What's the impact you know, to bringing in departments into manage and understanding and them interacting on that single source of truth? Wait that out. You know, how much time is that gonna save us now not having to go through these bombs and validate everything a hundred different ways? There's a lot to that, right? But we wanna weigh out your problems and hit those heavy hitters as soon as we can. Investigate all areas, pre-sales, fulfillment, post-sales, you name it. You know, how do you get an order and how does that order get out the back? And then how do you make sure that order and that customer are happy? That's what we need to talk about much more than engineering. And that's the full solution, right? That's digital manufacturing at its best, really. Um, Internal customers, I mentioned to you, I have just as many issues with internal uh, departments as I do with, you know, interfacing with your supply chain or a client, which shouldn't be the case, but it is. So not only do we want to ask, you know, and understand how things are going, but if you have that, those multiple geographic locations, it's probably worthwhile asking, you know, how each geographic location is handling the information that they're required to handle and what do they need out of this system. Um, how do you collaborate between engineering, between these departments that are over in Wichita? That's great questions to ask. Identify where your process starts. This is a funny one to me because I get a different answer every, depending on who I ask. Um, that's important though, right? We want to understand where this initiates and how does it initiate because we want to capture it up front and make sure it's available to everybody downstream. And if I don't know where things begin, or we, we have different opinions of where things begin, then that in itself is probably our issue, if you ask me, right? Everyone thinks that data is coming, starting somewhere else. So be real on number six and understand where the things go and start. And number seven was the bomb. I, I can't overstate that. Like I said, I would start with those bombs because they seem to drive a lot and uh, fix the bomb. And I think other things will fall into place. Keys to success, this just, again, this goes back from 20 something years of, of doing these types of high level implementations across multiple geographic locations and getting teams on the same page. You know, identify a team, get a project lead for this. Someone's got to initiate it, back them up, make sure that, you know, the, the higher ups and everybody's on board. This is something that we're going to take a heavy look at everybody. And again, it's to benefit all of us, right? We want to stay competitive. So we all have jobs tomorrow. That's what we're after. Um, have that strategy, wait out those issues, 
it's just like any other project, but we do need to be diligent in laying this out and understanding how to approach it. I think that's why things fail often is the approach was wrong. Um, engage these employees, get those feedback. Uh, I, I get creative on this, you know, sometimes it could be a piece of paper in the lunchroom that says, hey, write your thoughts down. But sometimes it could be, you know, I'll give you a $50 gift card to dinner for you and your significant other if you fill this out and let me know what you think. However, we get that information, we kind of need to know what the truth is. And and I sometimes I have to get creative to get that understanding. Budget constraints and infrastructure, sometimes that's the case, right? Sometimes, Rob, I'm not going to cloud. The data I have is too secret, it's too sensitive, there's no way we're putting it on cloud. Okay, no problem. Then that's not an option, that's a constraint. We look at other ways to do it, All right? That's what I'm referring to there is, you know, there are some things that just aren't gonna happen and we need to understand those. And then last, of course, take your time with this. This is a huge, huge endeavor. It's not like going from the drafting board to AutoCAD. I wouldn't even say it's like going from a Windows folder structure to PDM, right? None of those address the enterprise and what I'm talking about does. So the, the depth that these types of projects are going to take place is much greater than anything we've experienced in the past. But I think that's probably why we haven't, we still have problems, right? Everyone's doing their own things. We need to look at it as one project. And then a few additional things just to kind of keep in the back of your mind. Um, digital transformation and digital manufacturing means digital, okay? So again, if we have paper floating around, that's gonna be really tough to manage, you know, those types of documents. So scanning becomes a very important component to this. TPM has very tons of scanning services. We scan, if, if you can, if you have it, we can scan it. If it's paper, we scan it. If it's a crayon drawing, we scan it. If it's a human face, we scan it. Um, we scan it, get it into digital, right? Once we do that, now you're set up for success. But when we have that paper floating around, it gets a little bit wild west again on me, right? So we wanna go digital, scanning is important. Many of you have a quality um, department, they get left out as well. You know, I mentioned our inspection tools. These are PPAP, AS9102, you name it. We have inspection documents, we create them. This may change the role. I don't know who does that today, but I'm asking you to, maybe it's better for the designer to do that and, and change You know who does that kind of work. Um, so be open to that kind of manipulation as well of, of the job role of a person could potentially change based on these tool sets. Um, again, paperless initiatives with the model-based manufacturing, right? If you're not familiar with that, please reach out. It is, it is excellent technology and it's the stepping stone into a model-based enterprise. So we'd probably wanna look at, you know, where are you at on the model-based manufacturing rung, if you will, and then figure out a plan to get you into an enterprise uh, model environment. Electrical engineering, left out. We have SolidWorks Electrical, heck of a product, does your 2D schematics, routes wires in 3D, collaborates with the mechanical team, all on this backbone I'm talking about, so our bombs are the same, probably something to consider. You know, electrical engineering is, is often left out, but that's someone we wanna roll up into this, right? And then of course, your post-sales engagements. These are just questions and things that people have asked me, you know, Rob, I would love to be able to understand my superseded parts better. Or, you know, I would love to understand what's obsoleted and gain access to it or whatever. Um, these are questions and, and things just to kind of figure out, right? What happens after that when we send it out the back? And is there anything that we can do to, to help alleviate that process? Again, opening up resources, right? We don't want people spending time looking for superseded parts. That should be fairly quick. All right, in closing, everybody, this is, again, <laughs> the definition of digital transformation. It's uh, up for interpretation, I would say. Uh, there's many books and, and tons of information um, out there on, on this. You know, uh, there's large companies like, large old companies like Lego um, was a, in particular a case study I read about uh, where they had this old methodology. They were good, right? They were using a, a, they were probably using a rock to nail in their hammers. 
they were a good company, but they needed to update. And uh, the case study on how Lego went about that in a global manufacturing environment is outstanding. Um, but in itself, digital transformation, everyone's got a little opinion on it. This is how I like to tie it to the cost savings, right? It's just efficiencies in a company that hopefully give our clients better experience, possibly drive down costs, and then internally we use our resources to their best bet, right? To the best um, of the, that we can. A side note, I mentioned to you that I have seen my share of things fail, um, and I learned from those experiences, but that purple box there, um, I found this data all over the internet actually, but this was in a book I was reading, and uh, this kind of really caught me you know, I, I took a step back because I hate to say it, I, I agree with it. Um, in my own personal experience, I think often these tools fail more, you know, more than they succeed. And I think that that has created a little bit, not animosity, but we're a little gun shy, right? We've all kind of seen applications come and go and, and things not work like they were sold. And, and, and so we're, you know, a lot of us, when it comes to that meeting, we're like, ah, here comes another product. But this is different because our approach is different. And I think that's all, that's the whole difference is the way TPM and myself approach these projects. And many of you have seen this when we, we communicate and talk to you about your SolidWorks, you know, just, I don't, I don't, I don't ask you, you know, about features and functions. And so I want to know how you're using it. I want to know if it's doing the job. I want to know what you're going to have coming down the future and make sure that we have something in line for you. That's where we're at, right? We got to understand why we're doing what we're doing and make sure that makes sense. And often it doesn't everybody. So anything you can do to help engage um, whoever needs to discuss this, that's what I would ask of everybody. Uh, this can't be done from, you know, a designer or an engineer. We need buy-in. We need input from other departments. Um, and, and we need to, to have those types of meetings in order to help facilitate this. But that is a challenge I'm having right now is it's people say, that's great, Rob, you know, but I don't think I can do that. You know, it's above my pay grade. Well, OK, well, whose pay grade is it not above? And that we need to talk to them, you know, so anything anybody can do to help engage those types of conversations, just know things have changed. We're much more than an engineering solutions provider at this point. These, this is where the future is heading. The engineering data is centric to the future, and that's why we're important. And I don't see it any other way. So I hope everybody got some good information out of this um, presentation. I tried to get through it as quick as possible. Um, I will be around. I have um, many of you can contact me. You have your sales reps you can reach out to if you'd like to discuss this initiative a little bit more. Uh, but again, I appreciate everyone's time discussing digital transformation and the future of these products and how we're going to go into a digital manufacturing environment and kick some butts. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day and a great week.